Fantastic. Good morning, everybody. How are you all? A little bit of information. Just want to give a couple of people a shout out before I begin speaking this morning. Um, I just want to say, um, Carol <laughs> and Susan. Tonight, they're officially becoming street pastors. <laughs> they are going to um, their graduation, I believe I've got a graduation, induction, swearing in, whatever it is, I don't know. They're going to be issued, like the Royal Marines, with their official caps tonight. Uh, only, only official people are to wear their caps. So uh, tonight, across at Sheffield, you see them afterwards where it is. If, you want, if you're able to get across, that would be wonderful. But we just wanted to say um, we're proud of you. We thank God for you. And we're believing that you'll be a difference and a blessing on the streets of Barnes as you serve as a street pastor. So massive round of applause. Please take that round of applause as a, as a prayer over you, uh, and we will be thinking of you and praying for you. Keep us informed and updated about your experiences and adventures. Uh, if you want to talk to either of them at the end, they'll be able to let you know where it's taking place tonight. Uh, that will be really good. And more notices. Next Friday at 1 o'clock, we're having a Thanksgiving service. Um, we're sharing that time with Bob and Catherine, uh, Thanksgiving for Nathaniel. So if you're able to be here at 1 o'clock... Um, will be, uh, and it's very much a thanksgiving service for the gift that God gave them for Nathaniel, okay? And one more thing, it is like notices. <laughs> What's this about? Um, we've got uh, Awaken is coming, you'll see the banner at the back, and I would like people who are booked in or been to one event and things to meet me in my little office where we're going to video you doing one sentence, one sentence, I'm going to awaken because, and then name something. I've got a list of things you can say, so it's completely scripted and artificial, but it'll look good, okay? So I'd love maybe six or seven people to come and do that, like, and look happy while you're doing it. I had some good ones that I used last time. I'm going to want you. Hey. I decided not to use those. Um, so I'd like to try and get grab some of those this morning after you've had your coffees and stuff. Uh, so then, on with the sermon. This is the next part in the uh, Promised King series. And just what I want to say is this morning, ask a question. What if what I'm saying, what if when people stand up here, uh, what if what they're saying actually matters? And it's not just a habit. And we're not just filling time. What if what we're saying matters? And if we've prepared before God, what if some of it is God's heart? Changes everything, that doesn't it? I know, you don't think, oh, but we all know that. Yeah, I know you like mentally assent to it, but what if when people stand up to speak, they'd waited and prayed and, and the Holy Spirit had been part of what they'd be doing in preparation? What if when people speak, it's God's heart shared to us? It does change everything, doesn't it? And it makes me ask this question, which is really the title of uh, this morning's talk, uh, this morning's sermon. And the title is something like this. You're right. You're not good enough. Okay, I just want to, just want to prophesy that over you. Yeah. You're right. You're not good enough. Yeah. You all receive that? Receive it in love, everybody. Uh, if you know you're not good enough, just like, let it affirm you. Uh, and if you think you're too good and you are good enough, let it break you. Because the question I want to explore this morning is, one of the questions I've been asking part of this series is, how do we become like him? How do we become like Jesus? This king, this king in his kingdom, are we good enough? Well, the amazing thing is, we are loved completely. And we're good enough for him. And he takes us as we are. Uh, so with those thoughts in, in your mind, I just want to share this, this radical piece of, of information with you. There's something about me that you don't know. As I've, been, I've been through this series referring to music, old and new, and records of all. Did you know that I recorded a record on vinyl? Yeah, me. I am a published artist. Um, nobody believed me, Joel. When I was 10 years old at Blackpool, I went into the arcade. And I put my money in the machine, 
and I sang Billy Don't Be a Hero <laughs> to a backing track. And five minutes later, I got a vinyl, 45-inch single of me singing Billy Don't Be a Hero <laughs> in the bin. For those at home, the question was, where is it? I don't think it even came back from the holiday. Um, <laughs> did you know that I formed a band? I was in a rock band when I was 10. And we, we met in the cellar at my house. And none of us could play an instrument. And none of us knew any words to any songs. So we sang to the record player. How many people have experienced singing to the record player or singing to your phone or singing to backing music in the mirror, into your airbrush or not for some of us? How many, oh, come on, put your hands up. Put your hand up at home on the comments. Go, who's sung? Oh, come on. All these oh, I've never sung to music. I've never, I've never danced around my bedroom. <laughs> Listen, every person in the Western world has pretended to be a pop star at some point. Or, or if you, sorry, 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 some of you are more middle class than that. Everybody's pre pretended to be Pavarotti at some point. <laughs> Everybody does. And the thing is, when you're singing along to a backing track, how good do you sound? When you're in the bathroom, how good are you? And then you have to sing in public. How humiliatingly bad are you at that point? We've all... And when you try to sing in public, everything just goes horribly wrong. Um, karaoke is the most amazing thing in the world. I mean, I've got a decent singing voice, but for some reason, the minute I, I stand up to do karaoke, it's like my brain forgets how to connect with my vocal cords. I, what is that about? We want to be something. We try to emulate. And when I was a kid, we were trying to emulate different bands by singing along to different... I mean, I was a, I was a big Black Sabbath fan and a big Meatloaf fan. And I knew every word of the entire... I've been paranoid and all. I mean, I just, you know, just knew it all. I could sing along to it and I could squeal and make all the noises. Except when you just sit, it just sounds terrible. Thank the Lord, but into my phone, so I want to record myself onto. All that is part is gone. Trying to be something. Trying to emulate somebody. When I was an apprentice, I faced a day um, when I was sent out to work alone. Anybody here done an apprenticeship? It's the scariest thing when one day they say, there are your tools, you're on your own. <sighs> I would, I, I've got to emulate the engineers I've been training under. I had confidently worked alongside other engineers for a number of years at that point. They were experienced, I'd become experienced, I'd done every kind of job, and then I was sent out for the first time. I went alone. I was given easy jobs, well within my ability. I was representing the company. I was capable, and I was absolutely terrified <laughs> because I was by myself doing it. And honestly, I, I, I literally did not know how to make a screwdriver work. It was just the most frightening few days of my life. In Matthew chapter 10, the disciples get sent out by themselves. Let me read to you. If you want to turn to it, you can do, um, either in your, your digital phones or in your Bible. Or, I'll just read it out to you. It's just a short section, eight verses. Matthew chapter 10, verses 1 to 8. Because we're looking at the whole concept of working through Matthew, both in our small groups uh, and on a Sunday morning as well when I'm speaking. So Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out in... So that, that's, remember that line. Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. And these are the names of the 12 apostles First Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out 
with the following instructions. Remember this phrase, sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse, I love that. cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Final phrase, freely you have received, freely give. Makes it sound so simple, doesn't it? I love the, the, the key phrases there. I give you authority. You know, we can't do this stuff without his authority. When we try to do this stuff without his authority, nothing happens. And actually, the word there, authority, um, it's, it's, it's a divine word, a kind of divine empowerment, a Holy Spirit empowerment. My first thought then this morning is, number one, called from diversity to purpose. We're called from diversity to purpose. This list is full of diversity. This long list of names... Who, when you get to names in the Bible, when you're reading your Bible, because you all read your Bible every day, don't you? Put your hand up if you do. Just put your hand up and pretend. <laughs> put your hand up if you've ever read part of the Bible. Thank God. Okay. Always read the names, because names matter. Those names are in there for a purpose, because they're real people, and real people get noticed by God. And real people get mentioned by God. And real people get recorded by God. And I love that when we get this list of disciples that are sent out, they get noticed. Don't you say, and the disciples got sent out. They got named. And I love it, the diversity and background. Jesus chose his disciples from all types of people. All they had in common was that one day Jesus had said to them, follow me. And they had. That is the only thing. He said, follow me, and they had. Apart from that, there was such a diversity. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 25, it says this, For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose. I love that. I love that. Whatever you were, wherever you were, God chose. You didn't qualify. You weren't good enough. You were just chosen. You were loved. He loved us first. I love here that names matter. So often we skip lists of names, but to Jesus, every name matters. Your name matters. Every person has worth and dignity. Neil and I were just chatting uh, before the meeting started, sat in the tech box at the back, just chatting about some stuff. And we were just, you know, we've got some challenges coming one day. We'll have things to wrestle with and sort out and values and theology to wrestle with. But, you know, the most important thing we both conclude at the end of this, we don't want to judge people, but we don't want to be dishonest with people. But I'll tell you what we do. We want, to, we want people to know that they have, they have worth, that they have dignity, that they are loved by God. And so we must reflect that. And so, you know, we don't have any of the answers for some of the tough stuff we were talking about, but what we do know is, for God so loved. Yeah. And we've got to be a reflection of that. Not, not, not so, God so loved, he said, just do your thing. But what did he say is, follow me. We've got to follow him. Take a, a look at the first sentence then. Jesus calls his disciples together. He calls his disciples together, but sends out his apostles have you ever noticed that? You've read that before. There's a transition takes place in a couple of sentences. He calls his apprentices and sends out his messengers. Yeah. This is their big moment. This is the, you've been with me, you've seen it done, you've seen it happening, here's the toolbox, off you go. You see, it's easy when you're with Jesus. When Jesus is in the room and he says, gather them all, let's feed 5,000 people, let's heal some sick people. Yay, Jesus is in the room. But then Jesus is no longer in the room. Let's have a prayer meeting and wait. Everything changes. They gather in diversity and difference, this group of people. But in Jesus they find a unity of purpose and identity. They stop being just disciples and become apostles they become messenger the word is simply messenger a messenger with a specific message specific purpose they've got a new identity they're no longer just the trainees they've gone up a whole new level 
they're sent out in Jesus name I love this because the moment we follow we start to become like him see at some point Jesus said follow me and they'd be start to become like him the moment we step forward and begin to follow we've begun to change we, we are less like what we were and more like what we're becoming the minute Jesus says follow me and we respond you do understand that don't you and that's a journey of highs and lows. It's got mountain tops and valley bottoms. Um, it's got foggy bits and clear bits. It's got setbacks and stumbles, and it's got victories and wins. But the minute we step back, step forward from, from where we were, and we start to follow, we begin to change. Our, desire, our apprenticeship begins. However small those steps may be, it begins. We must never return and step back. When we follow the king and his kingdom, we carry his kingdom purpose. Um, what we do then is who we are. You do understand that. I, mean, I, I love to, to have a go at this. You know, we are human beings, not human doings. Oh, get over it. Every person that lives and breathes finds their identity in what they do. We are design, you know, scripture even says like, we need, we're designed for work, we're designed to work, we're designed to be in community and to do. It's what we're about. And what we are called to do is to follow Jesus and to be like him. And I, I get me wrong, but that's what, is it an adjective? I don't know, well, it's, well, it's a doing word. Following is a doing word. Becoming is a doing word. We are becoming like Jesus. What we do is who we are. What we do is be like Jesus and we become like him, it's our identity. As an apprentice, the day came when I was trusted. Without that trust, I could have never gone further. You know, you need to just be dropped in the deep end sometimes. You need to be told, you've got this. Without trust, our vision for the future breaks down. Here's why. In any church or community, in this church, the vision is always released by the trust placed in others. And the confidence that the good news of Jesus made a difference in real people's lives. You know, just recently we've begun to give more responsibility to our, our uh, next line of leadership, our development and strategy team. Um, why? Because God's begun a good work in their lives. And he will complete it. And we have a vision for the next generation. And we have a vision for the generation after that. We have a vision that God is able to release people. And so we're beginning to release. You know, these people, you see them as apprentices, but I've got to tell you, they're equipped. They are capable to go and to lead and to do and to make it happen. They're capable of being sent out. They're capable of represented as well. They are us. So the apprentices, the disciples, become the representatives of Jesus sent out. They are the apostles sent with purpose. They're trusted by Jesus. But trusted for what? Trusted to follow, trusted to emulate, and trusted to learn. You know, I love this. Simply, Jesus simply says to them, go and be me. You've seen me do it. Go and do that. Go and emulate it. You know, when I wanted to emulate a pop band as a kid and record it, I wasn't equipped to do it. But Jesus has in, is inputted into these people. He says, you've got it. You just do, and you, I'm even giving you my authority and Holy Spirit. Go do You've seen me do it. You've seen how I say it. You've seen how I stand. You've seen, you know, how it works. Just do it. It really places such value on these people. And imagine how they must feel. Some of them have come from brokenness and nothingness and rejection and emptiness. Some of them have been outside of society. But Jesus restores to them dignity. And not only does he say, you can belong to me, you can be for me. Sent out in my place. I mean, come on, who doesn't need to? There's so many people need to hear that message. So many people need to understand in our very broken world that they are seen by God, that their name matters, that he picks them up and he prepares them. And they follow him and he sends them out. He brings purpose. Look at the disciples and a variety of backgrounds and experiences. This is what I just see. God taking people and bringing it together. The good news of Jesus the King get this the good news of Jesus the King for the oppressed and broken is that they're set free so they're free indeed they're freed from an inferiority and invisibility and so many people feel inferior and invisible we are set free in Jesus the good news for Jesus the King for the powerful and strong is this they're set free set free from a deluded sense of superiority 
and be better than others. Jesus changes everything because he says, leave everything you've got and follow me. You know, I'm the rich young ruler. You've done everything right, but now leave all of that and follow me. It's about who we worship and what we worship. Do we worship what we've had? Do we worship where we've been? Do we worship what we think we are? Or do we worship Jesus? We follow him. Jesus says, follow me, and so brings us together and gives us a new purpose, a new identity. I've got to be straight with you. I'll use some political language. This is levelling up without the politics. Politics removed and a divine dignity given to each of us as we follow Jesus. So who are you? What's your name? What, how do you see yourselves this morning? Because Jesus sees your name. And he loves you. And that knowledge, when he says, follow me, gives such dignity to who you are. Does it mean change is going to come? Well, of course it does. Put your hand up if you're exactly like Jesus now. Okay, so everybody's, everybody's on a journey. You know, the, the amazing thing is every one of us can reflect Jesus right now. But every one of us is becoming like Jesus on a journey. We become trusted to follow and emulate and to learn. There's an opportunity for each of us to find a path and a call, a new life in Jesus. Even... I love this. Even Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus, is sent out with Holy Spirit authority, with divine purpose, and did the things he saw Jesus doing. I know we don't like to say that. It's difficult to get your head around, isn't it? This is why we've always got to follow Jesus. Because left to our own devices, no matter what God has done with us before, that is not a crown for the future. That is not a reputation built. We can stop following Jesus catastrophically. And Judas stopped following Jesus, and it was a catastrophe. He got to choose, and he chose himself, he chose himself and not Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, it says this, Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all, its pa but all its many parts form one body. So it is with Christ, for we are all baptized by one Spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slaves or free. And we were all given the one Spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. How good is that? I just look, there is no uniformity within church. There is no, this is what it looks like. The only thing it looks like is Jesus. But what you bring to it is uniquely you. What God does with you is your name matters. So we get this wonderful confusion of, of we are individually seen and chosen by God and yet brought together as one. But you still matter. But you don't matter more than the gathering of people. The, the, oh, it's, it just blows my I just wrestle with this. But what I do know is Jesus is in it. And we become one in him. There are many of us in this room and many more to join us in the decades to come. But we are going to be so diverse. We're already diverse. We're going to be, and actually this morning we've got a fairly kind of standard got it together congregation sometimes we have you know got lots of people away. there's like a real diversity multiple languages multiple countries multiple ethnic origins how good is god yeah, yeah. but when we follow jesus we find purpose in that and unity in that and belonging in that my vision is for a diversity to grow um if it exists in our town if a person exists from a place or a background or an experience, I want them to follow Jesus yeah. and to be here and to find hope. Yeah. But the thing is, people don't feel good enough. People so often don't feel good enough. Isn't the church supposed to be full of good people? Who thought the church was full of good people? And then you joined one. <laughs> Who sometimes thinks the church still thinks it's full of good people? I never know how to answer these questions. <laughs> people often think the church is full of good people, or people that think they're good, or think they're better. Those of us that have managed to get into a church usually realise the opposite is true. This is what Eugene Peterson, a quote I read from him, churches are not, as a rule, model communities of good behaviour. They are rather to be places where human misbehaviour is brought out in the open Faced and dealt with in God. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. 
Churches are not, as a rule, model communities of good behaviour. They are rather to be places where human misbehaviour is brought out in the open, faced and dealt with in God. That's a great, I love that. I mean, goodness me, the disciples weren't perfect, but they came together in him. And everything they were was brought out as they followed and became like him. There's only one qualification for his kingdom, uh, for this kingdom place. Jesus calls, we follow, we emulate, we learn. So you're not sat here because you're in some way better than those people outside of this building. You're here because you feel called and you're trying to follow Jesus. And that is okay. That is the place to begin. You're in this room this morning, not because you're better than Barnsley, but because you've recognised the call of God. He said, follow me, and you've followed. And what we get to do is to take the good news of Jesus Christ into our town, empowered with his authority, the gift of the Holy Spirit to be his witnesses. Church is simply where people are being formed together through the presence of Jesus that they share together. That's what we're doing this morning. We have people being formed together through the presence of Jesus that we share together and then share with others. The qualification is Jesus calls you and you said yes. I love that. And if this morning you've not become a Christian, you've never said yes, we would love to lead you in that and we'd love you to find Jesus. We'd love you to start to follow. And if you're saying, oh, but my life is a mess and my life is broken, my life's not good enough, I can't, you know what, that's fine. Jesus simply said follow. And then the journey begins. You've heard it said, some of you will have heard it said in management things, learn to say no to the good so you can say yes to the best. Anybody heard that said? It became one of those big Christian things. You just sort of, you sermons just people, learn to say no to the good things so we can say yes to the best things. I just want to point out to you that the Bible is not full of throwaway sound bites. They're really hard. I know people like to preach from sound bites. Periodically, I like to. Um, but you know, yes to Jesus is an act of hope and trust that will lead to growth. Never wait to be good enough to say yes, because you'll only learn to say not yet. And when we say not yet, we're actually saying no. If Jesus calls, just say yes. Just say yes. Matthew chapter 9, as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. And then in the next chapter, so a few days or weeks later, Matthew is called to Jesus again and sent out as an apostle. Process this. We read these stories in sound bits and bits. But look, these guys were running with Jesus for about three years anyway. And Matthew here is sat in his tax, tax collector's booth, in a booth for self-preservation, in a box, where nobody can grab him or do him. Or he's like, in, pay your taxes. Hiding away. Jesus says, follow me. So this despised, hated, corrupt guy follows Jesus. And before he can blink, he's been sent out with the authority of Jesus to emulate Jesus, to carry the message of the good news of the kingdom. And you'll think you're not good enough. You worry that you get it wrong sometimes. You worry about what you watched on TV or what you did or what you said or the paper clips you pinched from the office. He said yes. Matthew simply followed Jesus. Our interpretations of our situations often need a fresh revelation. God has a strange way of saving the world. He sends you and me with good news about Jesus the King. We just need a revelation of Jesus and to say yes. And I've got to tell you, it's a mystery to me why he sends people like me. It's a mystery to me why he sends people like us. But he does. And if he's said that's what he's doing, that is because that is the only and best way to do it. You understand that, don't you? If you give your life to Jesus and we follow him, and our job is to share the good news of Jesus with others. That is the only and the best way of sharing the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, the good news of salvation in Christ. None of you seem like you believe me. 
Jesus trusts us even while we're still learning. Number two, which is much shorter than number one. To be someone new, we are called to be someone new to someone else. Okay, we're called to be someone new to someone else. Jesus, remember that one of the phrases said to look out for, Jesus sent out with the following instructions. I love that Jesus doesn't say, just go and do your thing. He gives very specific instructions. He's very clear about what's ex- expected of this. I love that on the first trip, their first journey out by themselves with the toolbox, with the spanners in their own hands. Ah, well, I've only done this with Jesus. Now I'm by myself. How do I do this? On their very first trip, he simply sends them out. And he's very clear to the disciples who've become apostles. Don't go here. Do go there. Not to them, but to them. Don't say this. Do say that. Do do these things. It's really clear. There's a little menu. This is how you need to do it. We're never sent to be everything to everyone all of the time. Hope House Church, are you in your life, you're not sent to be all things to all people all the time. Jesus knows we're learning and he sends us specifically and with purpose. The disciples are sent to a place they know and are known so that others will know they are different. Right, I want to say this over your life now. You are sent to a place that you know and are known, so others will know you are different. Just think on that for a moment. It's okay. See, I used to think, when I went to university and to Bible college and did all the practicing pastor thing, all of my friends, like they go to like exotic places now. They get called to exotic places around the world where you can wear shorts and the sun shines. And it's exciting. And I thought, when I'm a pastor, somebody actually, eventually, has got to actually reach Hawaii with the good news of Jesus Christ. <laughs> the Bahamas, I feel, need to hear Jesus The Greek islands clearly need to know that Jesus is Lord. But no, I get to go to Rochdale. (laughs) And I'm sure they need to know Jesus is Lord, but honestly, it's like going to Mordor. (laughs) Who also needed to know that Jesus Christ is Lord. If you're watching from Rochdale this morning, because one or two of you are, we love you. Um, (laughs) Where you are sent matters. He sends you into your life, into your circumstance, your place of work, your next door neighbours, your family, your situations with the good news of Jesus. And as you are changing, become more like him. They know you, so they know the change. They see you, so they see the change. They hear you, so they hear the change. And so when Jesus says, follow me, don't despise that in your setting. Don't think, oh, but I can just do my thing because I'm not an international evangelist. I can do my thing because I'm not called to the nations. You can do your thing because you're called to follow Jesus in every circumstance of life. And it matters. Your name matters there. Jesus tells them they have the authority to say the kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Oh, that's okay then. <laughs> what? Can you imagine the, the, the apostle's face at that point? No, that's what you do, Jesus. That's your thing. We just cheer you on. We just write, bring people to you and we all clap and cheer. Matthew has only just joined and you want him to say yes to getting involved. He's a tax collector. People will notice that's Matthew the tax collector. But now he's sent to be like Jesus amongst the same people with which he's a tax collector. Matthew has been called from a tax collector's booth to go and bring good news of Jesus Christ. You are called from your booth. You're called from your zone your safe place, into a dangerous place to look and sound like Jesus. That's a good thing, isn't it? It's a really good thing. Jesus restores the people, society's boxed in, people stereotyped, people rejected, people given up on. The transformation is so radical that we see people responding with amazement. So if you are one of those people that feels boxed in, if you're one of those people that feels stereotyped, if you're one of those people that feels rejected, if you're one of those people that that you think everybody will give up on, here's the deal. The transformation in Jesus can be so radical that people can be amazed. And sometimes our just living can be a miracle. Sometimes our just getting out of bed and being there 
and saying, I am following Jesus is a miracle that other people see. Are you good enough? No, but Jesus is in you. Jesus' call is over you. Jesus' call is not removed from you. We simply have to say, yes, I'm following you. How? But we don't disciple by preaching against sin. Did I get away with that one? I might have just thrown that one away. We don't disciple people by preaching against sin. Oh my days, I'm about to be excommunicated. I can, I'm not looking up because I can feel some people's eyes burning. If they've got laser vision, I would be a heap of ash right now. When we focus on avoiding sin, we're defeated by moralism and an impossible standard. Don't get me wrong, I'm not encouraging you to sin and I'm not justifying it. I'm just saying let's not just make that the centre of our lives. We, thank, we think God says, thou shalt not do things. And when we think thou shalt not, we focus on our sin. God actually says, you shall love the Lord your God. You shall love others. The focus is becoming like him. And as we become like him, we become less like we were. So our sin is left behind. We repent of that. We turn from that. We stop worshipping that and start to worship Jesus. So, you know, when we focus and moralise on things, when we think Christianity is purely moralising, we drive people away. What we are saying is, here is the love of God expressed to you, experienced by you, shared with you. And when we love somebody like that, when we're loved like that, we change to become like them. So, of course, sin falls away. Sin can be repented of. Sin can be put to one side. But the focus of the good news is not thou shalt not, but that we get to love God because he first loved us. But don't for a moment think you can run away with grace on that one. That it means you can just do your own thing. No, no, we want to become like him. Matthew 3, verse 2 says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the point. We repent. We stop worshipping that because the kingdom of heaven, God, is near. We stop worshipping that because we want to worship him. That's the point. Remember, repent is not just about... We've always said, it's turning from this and turning to that. Well, it kind of is, but the whole picture, the way it's used, is about worship. So we stop worshipping one thing and begin to worship correctly. And we worship God correctly. We live a life correctly for him in a way that reflects him. We repent because our focus is on Jesus the King, not on our sin. Being a Christian is not about living the life perfect, but wrestling with life faithfully. Who's perfect here? Raise your hand now, please. Oh, who's been perfect? Raise your hand now, please. We wrestle with life faithfully before God as we become like him. All we have to do is to be part of, uh, to be part of this is to say yes. You living your life without hiding Jesus can change everything for everyone. It's not the situation that has changed but you. Do you understand that? Your situation circumstance might be exactly the same, but who you're talking about, who you're looking to, who you are following changes when we begin to follow Jesus. So we may carry many of the same things, we may have many of the same life challenges, we may still not have a job, we may still be dealing with things, we may still be wrestling, but here's the deal now, we are still following Jesus. Yeah. Everything changes. No matter what the battle is, no matter what the journey, no matter what the weakness, no matter what the stumbling is, no matter what the mountain top or valley, no matter what setbacks there might be, we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. So when the storm comes, and there will be storms, have you ever walked through a storm? I've, I've discovered this, this reality I'm just off the top of my head now. I once bought an amazingly expensive uh, mountain jacket for walking about in the rain and cold weather. And I put the, the jacket on, and do you know what? It still rained on me. And the wind still blew. I thought once I got that amazing raincoat, the rain wouldn't be able to fall on me. And I'd be all right. You know, the deal is, we put Jesus on, and it still rains on us. But we carry on, because we've put Jesus on. We have a layer of protection. We have a security. We have a future. Don't think bad things can't happen to you because you're a Christian. Life happens to us, but Jesus. Don't beat yourself up because life stuff happens, because you're challenged, because there are things in your life. Just keep following him. You know, it frustrates me that, that 
I, I'm, I'm about to pretend to do a marathon. I, I haven't decided if I'm going to do it yet in two weeks' time. Um, but you get given a starting place. Like it, Everybody does 26 miles and so many, 300 and some yards. Everybody does that. Like 42 kilometres. Everybody gets to do it. But some people, oh no, they start in the golden boy spot at the front. <laughs> And then they look at your age, and after a few years, they start putting you in the middle bit. And then I apply, and they put me in this bit over here. <laughs> the yellow bit. I used to be in the golden bit. Now I'm in the, like, mustardy yellow colour bit. <laughs> at the back. So no matter what I do, I am bound to come near the back of the race. Because for one thing, there's 50,000 of us, and I'm, like, starting 45,000th before I even start the race. So no matter what happens, I'm not going to win. I'm going to be at the back. When everybody else is finishing and celebrating, I'm going to be at the back. Some of us draw the cord and we're at the back. But we're still in the race and we're still going to complete it. I've just, put, I've just given you a right slammer. You're about to do a marathon as well. Um, hey. Taking my roller skates. Um, some of us think because we're starting in the yellow on the back grid that we're not as good, that we're not worthy. That we, you know what? We all have our race to run. Yeah. Our race to run. And the distance is the same. Yeah. The finishing line is the same. Yeah. The reward is the same. Yeah. The presence of God is the same. Yeah. The call is the same. The one that we follow is the same. Yeah. Take courage. Say yes to Jesus. Better bring this down quickly. The extent of our courage or cowardice cannot be seen in a safe life or in ordinary times. Everything is seen when something begins to happen in our lives. Who we are and who we keep turning to when the bad things come and the storm comes, that begins to show where our faith lies. I have loved recently watching the church in Ukraine. I've started following uh, Vineyard Church across Ukraine. Ukraine. Uh, I posted one or two things on the uh, Hope House Church Facebook page. Love seeing some of the stuff that they're doing, the worship, the heart, the passion. It has been so good. Um, seeing them worship. I mean, they've been reduced down to a couple of guys with a... With, with a a guitar in a room, worshipping, asking for prayer, sharing good, good news, sharing good stories from their church in Maripol, where, where everything's been destroyed. They asked for prayer because the last of their church were leaving that city just the other day. Um, but you know what? When they worship, they're still worshipping. Yeah. When they proclaim the goodness of God, they're still proclaiming it in truth. And I love their passion. Check, check, out some of the, check out some of the posts I've put on on the church Facebook page. But understand this. The storm has come for them, and they're following Jesus. Deuteronomy says, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified, for the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. So here's the deal. We need courage because we put ourselves out there in a dangerous place. In your ordinary life, in your situation with your family, in your neighbours, in your work situation, in your day-to-day -day living, when we, when we mention Jesus, when we live for Jesus, when we sound like Jesus, that becomes a dangerous place spiritually. Sometimes it can be a dangerous place physically. But it is also the best place to find courage, to know that Jesus is with you. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. You know, the only time you need... What, what, when do you need courage? When you're in trouble, when you're under fire, when you're in a valley. I have, I have never found, sat with a glass of wine on a beach, I've needed courage. That kind of comes really easy. Really easy. But the Bible from page one to the last page is full of big, take courage, be strong, be faithful. Because, number three, life isn't anything. Sorry, it, it, it doesn't cost anything but everything. This doesn't cost anything but everything. It says in the very last line I read earlier, freely you have received, freely give. To pray your kingdom come, your will be done, is not a passive prayer, hoping God will step in. It's an active response and choice to participate, to follow Jesus in whatever circumstances we find ourselves. Facing difficulty in your life, your kingdom come. Facing illness in your life, your kingdom come. Facing unemployment in your life, your kingdom come. Facing challenges in your family, your kingdom come. Your circumstance, your name, your situation, your kingdom come. But that isn't a passive thing. 
I'm not into revival, because revival means I'll sit here going, ah, and then God just gets to do everything. When God says, let's do this together. Jesus trusts you to represent him as you learn to do that. As you learn to pray your kingdom come, he trusts you to begin to represent him increasingly day on day on day. We become the kingdom bringers and that takes courage. Uh, I want to read you some marriage vows. If ever I have challenges in any, I don't mean for me personally, um, <laughs> pastorally. I, I, what I want to spend most of my life doing is taking people, if I just could take people back to the marriage vows that they made and say, that, just do that. Oh, but uh, what do I do with that marriage? That. Do that. Do all the things that you promised you'd do. And th that will help. It's a great place to start. It's not going to be everything. But it's a really good place to start. Let me read. I've, I've, I've neutralised it. The marriage vows that we make here. For, from today, the other will take precedence in your love, faithfulness and care above any other. Parent, child, brother, sister, friend, interest, hobby or pleasure. They are your prior commitment. They must come first in your affections, loyalty, care and attention before everything and everyone else. And you know when marriage stops working, it's when some of those things start becoming more important than the other person. Every time. Every time. And I know people don't like me to point this out to them because I've pointed it out to them and I, they've never liked it, ever. They've always wanted a, a divine miracle or the other person to understand that they're perfect. And they're not. Everybody, and when we start to put anything before Jesus, in the think of our relationship with Jesus like a marriage. When anything gets in between me and Jesus, things begin to go wrong. We make the relationship the priority over everything else so that everything else thrives for the good of everyone else. When Jesus is my priority relationship above everything else, then everything else will thrive for the good of everyone else. It's just true. Marriage isn't passive, it's a choice and it's a reflection of our relationship with God. When we pray, your kingdom come. We invest in it, we live it. So it costs us everything. In an uncertain world that we are sent into, we can become distracted by all the issues that affect us. Because there are so many things around us. Then we forget we're called to a commission and God says, go into all the world. In the uncertain times that we face now, our message of Jesus, the King of the Kingdom, being near may seem hollow to some people out there when they see the mess of the world. But our message has never been more important. The good news of Jesus has never been more important than right now. Life can be uncertain, but God is always sovereign. He trusts us to share his good news. 2 Timothy chapter 1. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, of love, of self-discipline. Isaiah 33 verse 6, he will be the sure foundation for your times, a rich store of salvation and wisdom and knowledge. Here's how we are to be in a suffering world. To be a Christian, a Christ follower in our broken world never asks us to compare our life or our suffering or our losses to other people's. We must never compete with or dismiss the suffering and losses others experience. Or to think we are more blessed because we don't experience them. We can bring the presence of Jesus into situations. And we can bring people into the presence of Jesus. Lots of people feel unclean. Lots of people feel they've got sickness or history. Or spiritually they're exposed. Or they've got the wrong background. Or well, they've stopped entering into a relationship with God. And Jesus restores them. So often, there's a phrase used in the New Testament, so they were unclean, but Jesus restored them. Yeah. Unclean means that they were away. But the circumstances of life had stopped them connecting with God, stopped them worshipping, stopped them being included, stopped them belonging, but Jesus restores them. Yeah. And Jesus says to us, follow me. He says, follow me and go and restore people. He just asks us to say yes and to trust him. We don't perform any of this through our power. We act in Jesus' name and by Jesus' authority. He says, then I'll put my Holy Spirit on you. And you'll be my witnesses to the, to, to the ends of the Go, just go, just go. And he'll be with us to the very end of the age. You know, so often we want the Holy Spirit so our worship's good. We want the Holy Spirit so we can 
see gifts move in this room. But we need the Holy Spirit to be witnesses, to share the good news of Jesus. That is our priority. So that the gifts of the Holy Spirit that we have are expressed outside of this room. So the fruit of the Holy Spirit is lived outside of this room. Here's where we practice. Here's where we learn to be as ambassadors, to represent Christ. And we never sell the good news, we give it freely. The heart of the good news of Jesus is the grace of God, and that is always a free gift. Ephesians 2 verse 8 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourself, it is the gift of God. You know, when we see a broken person, when we see the paralyzed man on the mat, we don't join him on the mat and empathize and share his pain. We carry him into the presence of Jesus. Then both our lives are joined together as we enter the loving presence of Jesus, who does understand and share our suffering. Here we find comfort and mercy and grace to live. That is the gift of God that we share. The beginnings of following Jesus living the Christian life, is simply to say, yes, Lord. Can the band come back up, please? So there are many things we can say yes for. There are many things you can begin to follow in. And as we begin to follow, it becomes easier to put down the stuff. Sometimes we think I've got to put down all the brokenness. I've got to put down all the mess. I've got to put down all the mistakes, and then I can follow Jesus. We follow Jesus, and as we follow Jesus, that enables us to put that stuff down. As we begin to worship him, that stuff begins to fall away. It becomes a natural thing to do. It becomes a supernatural, normal thing to do. And so we've got to say yes to Jesus. I'm going to ask us this morning to say yes to Jesus. It might be, you know, we've, we've got Easter coming up and we've got, we'd love to have a baptism service. We have one candidate. Yay! I love people to be, if you've never been baptised, if you've never sorted that out with God, if you've never been fully immersed and baptised scripturally as the Bible describes it, we would love to talk to you about that because that is such a key part of our discipleship. What about your beginning to follow God in that area of your life and simply say, yes, yeah, I'll do that. What about if it means living differently? What about on Monday morning if you don't say, yes, Lord, I'm following you. Give me your authority to live differently, to share differently, to sound, to be different, to be seen to be different, to be seen to be yours. What if this Sunday morning means something so that Monday morning is different? So that your life is different? I'm just going to pray. I'm going to hand back to worship. I'm going to pray the prayer of commitment that we so often pray about becoming a Christian. But as I'm doing that, I'm praying that as a recommitment. It's a way of us saying again, Jesus, I am following you. Lord Jesus, I know I've done things wrong in my thoughts, words, and actions. There are so many good things I have not done. There are so many wrong things I have done. I'm sorry for those wrong things and turn from everything I know to be bad. You gave your life for me on a cross, and gratefully I give my life back to you. Now I ask you to come into my life. Come in as my Savior to clean me. Come in as my Lord to lead me. And I will serve you all the remaining days of my life. Amen. That is a prayer asking Jesus to be our King, to be our Lord. So as we worship now, I just encourage you to respond, to stand as you feel appropriate. If you need prayer, I'm going to encourage you to come forward for prayer. You won't be on camera. Don't worry. We'd love to pray for you for healing. We'd love to pray for you about baptism. We'd love to pray just to encourage you. We'd love to pray with you as you perhaps repent, or we'd love to pray with you as you say, I just want to follow Jesus, better want to get it right. Just come and stand down here, we'll, we'll take care of that. Just to my left, you'll be off camera, so don't need to worry. And we'll come and stand with you and pray for you. And if you just want to stand where you are and bring your worship, that is all right. That is all right. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make your Monday morning different to last Monday morning. The Lord fill you with his Holy Spirit to be his witness. The Lord allow you to say, I am following you, Jesus. Amen.